Hello and welcome to the history of Stargate. Today's episode, the Veneer. Members of the Veneer are psychologically very similar to the Asgard, as they were descended from the same race. Like their Ida cousins, the Veneer employ cloning as a means of propagating their race. However, the Veneer have two small implants placed on their bodies, one located above the right eye and another on the left chest. It is unknown what the purpose of these devices are, although it may be related to their more advanced cloning techniques. Like the Asgard of the Ida Galaxy, the Veneer suffered the negative effects of generations of cloning and recloning themselves, and sought means by which to stabilize their genetic culture. However, where the Ida Asgard were unwilling to engage in acts that risked others' lives in that endeavor, the Veneer, consumed with the desire to survive, believed that the ends justified the means. Their primary goal was survival. As they did not wish to end up like their distant cousins, which would result in the loss of a hundred thousand years of history. The history of the Veneer began over ten thousand years ago when they split from their Asgard kin and made their way to the Pegasus Galaxy. This was during the early years of the war between the Lanteans and the Wraith. This distraction allowed the self-exiled Asgards to begin their experimentation on humans in order to solve their cloning problem without interference from either the Asgard High Council or the Landian Council. They believed that the war between the Lanteans and the Wraith would give them enough time to find a solution to their genetic problems caused by repeated clonings of their species. However, the war took an unexpected turn when the Lanteans were forced back to Atlantis and abandoned the Pegasus Galaxy, leaving the Wraith to become the dominant species of the galaxy. Unlike the Lanteans, who would have censured only their illicit research, the Wraith did not tolerate any species with advanced technology other than their own. To that end, they began attacking the Veneer. Caught off guard, what intergalactic ships the Veneer possessed were destroyed, and they lacked the means to construct new ones. In order to survive, they abandoned their settlements and retreated to a planet whose atmosphere was toxic so that the Wraith would not be able to find them. Their new homeworld was somewhat tolerable to live on at first, only requiring the use of breathing apparatuses. Over the eons, the planet became more and more hostile, which required the Veneer to make use of powerful armored exoskeletons to protect them. This continued for nearly 10,000 years until the planet became too hostile for the race to survive on by the year 2008. Desperate, they ventured out into the galaxy for the first time in centuries and discovered a secret outpost with a powerful weapon in it. They theorized that the device could cripple the Wraith on an ongoing basis. However, a crucial component was missing. When Dr. Rodney McKay and Dr. Daniel Jackson found a hidden lab in Atlantis, they unwittingly transmitted a subspace signal that was picked up by the Veneer, who deduced that whoever sent the signal had found the means to make the weapon work. Three Veneer went into the city, obtaining the missing component, and took McKay and Jackson with them to get the device up and running, something the Veneer were unable to do due to their lack of the ancient technology activation gene. While holding the two captive, one of the Veneer revealed his identity to Jackson, as well as the history of his group. He stated that it was a matter of survival and that they had to use the Arturo device, despite the fact that it caused Stargaze to overload and explode while it was in operation. The Veneer traveled only by ship and were not concerned about the loss of either the gates or anyone who might be nearby, only caring for what would help destroy the Wraith. When Lt. Col. John Shepard arrived in a traveler ship to rescue McKay and Jackson and stop the device, three Veneer spaceships engaged the traveler ship in battle over the planet. The traveler ship destroyed two, but the third fled into hyperspace with the Arturo device control key. Eventually, McKay and Jackson were able to disable the device, and it along with the facility were destroyed, foiling the Veneer's plan. In 2010, the Veneer began a new plan to save their race. Force ascended Asgard Rand to return to mortal form so that they could get at her eggs. As Ran ascended before the degradation of the Asgard race began, her genetic code was undamaged and she had thousands of eggs the Veneer planned to use to save their race by combining the eggs with their own damaged genetic material, believing that they could start a new generation of their race this way. 
While they had a device that would force Ran back to mortal form, the Veneer, fearing that doing so or simply returning to mortal form would damage Ran's eggs and chase Dr. Elizabeth Weir, who Ran had ascended and returned to mortal form for experimentation to determine this possibility. During the chase, a Veneer warship was shot down over Cetata by Dr. Rodney McKay with a puddle jumper, only leaving one badly injured Veneer, Dis, alive. Desperate to save Dis for answers, the Atlantis team took him to a planet where traveler Dr. Decus had noted similar architecture to the crashed Veneer ship. On the planet, they found an abandoned Veneer installation and used its field medical station to heal Dis's injuries. Dis explained the Veneer plan to the team, showing no remorse for the lengths the Veneer were willing to go to to save their race as opposed to the Asgard, who were willing to destroy themselves instead. Dis offered to stop chasing Weir in exchange for his freedom, but refused to cease the Veneer plan to pursue Ran. Weir offered another solution, however, approach Ran directly and ask for her help. Dis agreed to try this idea, and the team and Dis used an old Asgard scout ship, held in mothballs, in the facility to travel to a shrine on Earth, where Dis begged for Ran's help. Ran returned to mortal form and agreed to help the Veneer attempt to save their race. However, she warned their plan might not work, and if it did, the Veneer might not get the result they wanted. Dis took it as it was the best hope the Veneer had in a long time. As they departed, Ran promised the Atlantis team that Veneer would no longer be a problem to them. The Veneer had advanced technology vastly superior to anything the Tari had developed themselves ranging from hyperspace-capable starships that could pass through Atlantis shields with ease, to personal energy shields and transportation devices. They also possessed energy weapons similar to Wraith stunners, and appeared to have at least a rudimentary understanding of ancient technology, as witnessed by their discovery of the location and purpose of the Arturo device. It is unknown how much of any of their present technology was based on Asgard technology developed by their Ada Galaxy counterparts as much of their original technology, such as their intergalactic starships, were destroyed during their first war with the Wraith, which forced them to remain in the Pegasus Galaxy. It's quite safer to assume that they possessed a heightened intellect like their cousins, so it's not surprising that they had developed such advanced technology, even under the harsh conditions they lived in. One impressive piece of Van Eyre technology was their impregnable armored exoskeletons. The armor had a wide range of technological abilities imparted on its user, giving them superiority in personal combat. The weapons and shields used on the Van Eyre ships appeared to be inferior to those of the Asgard, in the Ida Galaxy, and the Lanteans, but they were a match for those of the Traveler. They originally had ships capable of intergalactic travel, suggesting that mainstream Asgard technology was more advanced in every aspect to the interstellar ships they now use. Indeed, they stated that they had no resources to build more intergalactic ships, so their current ship's inferior state is likely due to a lack of resources available to them to build better ships. Indeed, Dr. Rodney McKay was able to shoot down one of these ships with just a puddle jumper without intending to do so. Additionally, the Veneer possessed a superior cloning technique due to experiments on humans in the Pegasus Galaxy. And although far from solving the problem, it leaves them slightly healthier than their Ida cousins. However, they have still taken great genetic damage and their bodies aren't going to last much longer either. They also possess a device that could force ascended beings back into mortal form but they did not use the device since they feared it could potentially damage the eggs of the ascended Asgard female Ran, which would contrast with their plans to use her eggs to save their species. Hey, thank you for watching the History of the Veneer. Special thanks to the Stargate fandom for all information you heard today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you have, thank you. Hey, we have one more thing. We do take requests here at Omega Ordained. What is your favorite ship we haven't covered? Who's your favorite personnel? Any suggestions? We'll put them on the list. I really wish we would have got to see more of the veneer. I would have liked a conclusive end to the Asgards one way or the other, even though they are kind of an offshoot. Perhaps they would have covered this in Stargate Atlantis in a later season. Two episodes with the veneer were not enough. And thank you kindly to all that came over from Stargate Omega. I appreciate the trek, as it were. And have a nice day. Bye-bye.